leading us in worship. Man, y'all were doing a good job today. Second crowd, y'all usually like a little more mellow, you know, you slept in. But uh, today, I felt like y'all were bringing it, okay? So I'm going to try to preach on y'all's level. So uh, for those of you that are guests with us, uh, every now and then, uh, during the summer months, we do a series called Summer at the Movies. And uh, we're continuing that series for the next several weeks. And today, we're looking at the classic from 20 years ago. Um, it was called How to Lose a Guy in 10 days. How to lose a guy in 10 days. And um, if some of you are unfamiliar um, with this plot line, which I was, uh, you know, I'd seen it once, because uh, once you've seen a rom-com, why well, watch it again? But um, I remember that basically we're going to look at two individuals. Uh, we have Matthew McConaughey's character and Kate Hudson's uh, character. And they have different incentives for their love interest. Um, Kate Hudson's character, she um, is a writer, an aspiring writer, up and coming, and she needs to write a spicy article, and through happenstance, she develops um, this thought process, and the title of the article is How to Lose a Guy in 10 Days, and she thought she would do all of these things that um, girls do to sabotage relationships, you know, like overly clingy or, you know, like mothering your your, your partner, like, oh, blow your nose. Anyway, um, various other things that can't be mentioned. Uh, Kroll. Anyway, so um, as she's doing that, Matthew McConaughey has a different incentive. He has an account um, with a diamond dealer that could be the kind of the count of a lifetime that's going to raise his status to superstardom, and, and he has to make a girl fall in love with him in 10 days in order to get to pitch the account. So both of them have some incentive, but they are definitely not aligned in their motivations. And I thought we would watch this first clip together and then we would start discussing it. So watch this with me. Good night, Andy Anderson. Oh, you are already falling in love with me. I'm gonna make you wish you were dead. Poor guy. Poor guy. Poor guy. We have a graphic that has both of those quotes on there. And, and I thought we'd start the sermon with thinking about mixed messages. And we could, we could say that they definitely, definitely had different desires. And it was that, uh, that thing that was driving them was their desire for future success not for the other person, but for themselves. And I thought we would kind of explore this in James chapter 3. It says, For where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you find disorder and every evil practice. But the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure, then peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial, and sincere. I think that James kind of gave us a formula, didn't he? When you think about it, he said there's two bad ones, envy and selfish ambition, and then he balanced it out with like six good ones, like a laundry list. Have you ever thought about that maybe as a formula that sometimes whenever you have something negative to say, are you balancing it out with double the positive. Isn't that a good strategy in general, right? If you're going to have some hard things to say, then are you going to praise me when I do well, or do you only criticize me when I do wrong? And I think that if you want to divide a team, you know, just make sure that you hammer people every time that they get it wrong. Um, you got to find ways to praise people when they get it right to inspire them. And I, I started thinking about that even since this movie is a romantic comedy from a, a relational level, right? That they started off with mixed messaging. They started off with different foundations. And we could even use the second subpoint that a wrong foundation oftentimes leads to dangerous situations. Because when you think about it in your evolution of all relationships, you know, and I'm not I'm not talking about middle school love. Okay, that's not love, all right? But but once you get into high school and especially in college and your young adult life, the the consequences of relationship 
ever increase as you move toward intimacy and you move towards marriage and you move towards even bringing children into this world. And so, therefore, imagine if you started off a relationship and you were not on the same page. Imagine that you, you had different motives for why you wanted to be in this relationship. And imagine you didn't find out that the other person had an ulterior motive till well into the game. And whenever we're playing the dating game, I bet, I bet all of us in here probably have a story of when we were in a relationship and we found out at some juncture that someone had had an ulterior motive. By show of hands, anybody in here? Okay, you other half that didn't raise your hand, you're the ones that were playing the games. That's players. Whenever we think about this scene, it's, it's so interesting, right? That when we apply it to real life, that imagine people get into relationships and a lot of times maybe they didn't even intend for this relationship to go anywhere. But then it did. But because you started off with different goals in mind, imagine that you, that projects further and, and then you have chaos because if you didn't align on the most important things, let's just say that one person was a believer and the other person wasn't. And then Maybe one person had a value for church and one person didn't. Maybe one person said God's word needs to be rule in our life and the other person was like, I just think we should do whatever we think is right in our own eyes. And, and then like that begins, like, and the first in a relationship, you can get through that because it's all like puppy dog, oh, it's okay, you know, they're so cute. And then, then, then after a while, you know, like a week of marriage, like <laughs> it's, not, it's not cool anymore. And then sometimes people double down and they think, well, you know, we're struggling, so you know what we need to do is bring a child into this world. And I'm going to tell you that bringing a child only further complicates things because now, because your house divided, because you didn't start off with the same foundation, you didn't start off with your compasses pointing in the same direction, you are going to push your kid one way and they are going to push the kid the other way. And then who's right and who's wrong in that scenario? You talk about a recipe for some drama, that's some drama right there. And so I just want to encourage you, those of you that are dating, man, you should get on the same page about what the most important thing is. And I'm going to suggest to you that whenever we have these um, insecure foundations, that we think about the dangerous situations it leads to, it can, it can lead to the dangerous situation of divorce. As a matter of fact, whenever you think of earthquakes, right, um, I don't know if you've ever seen the aftermath, but... If you, if you look at a row of buildings, what will be amazing is, is that if you had 10 buildings and nine of them are standing after the earthquake, with this one, it just crumbled to the ground. And before the earthquake, you would have looked at them and they would be indistinguishable. They would look the same. But when the pressure came, when the earthquake came, let's say that someone skipped some steps because of cost or whatever, and they didn't put the effort in to the exact letter so that it was earthquake proof, well, up until there's an earthquake, no one will ever know. But eventually, there's going to be a storm that is strong enough, an earthquake that produces enough pressure that it will reveal what is beneath the surface. I guarantee you, if you've been in a relationship long enough, my goodness, you will find out. I mean, you're married five years, 10 years, huh? You found out some things, didn't you? Didn't you? Yes, you did. There was some stuff below that surface. I think that you, actually most people are ever evolving in figuring out themselves. I think that it takes a lifetime to, to try to figure out what is it that is actually motivating me and why is it that I act a certain way? Why are these habits so so repeated in my life? And, and I think it takes a little bit of introspection, right, to figure out why those things are occurring over and over again. I hope that I can give you some uh, help today. I just want us to look at that dichotomy and consider in those verses, it says that where there's selfish ambition and envy, it leads to disorder and every evil practice. Think about that. 
Are you attracted to disorder? Or maybe we would say it a different way in today's culture. Drama. Does, does drama follow you? Like, how does it find you everywhere you go? Like at the store it finds you. At work it finds you. At home it finds you. Even at church it finds you. Like, how is that possible? Is it, oh, what could it be? I'll just let you think about that. And maybe you have to learn to change the way you act. Very hard to do, though, right? James is talking about there's two different types of wisdom. There's wisdom that comes from above, and there's wisdom that comes from below. He said the wisdom that comes from below, this worldly, worldly wisdom, it's, it's for you. So let's just imagine that you fancy yourself as a straight shooter. You know, I'm a straight shooter. Well, yes, but you can be blunt, and sometimes the way you phrase it is not going to get the desired result because here James says that the, the wisdom that comes from above is pure, and the second one was peace-loving. And sometimes I get the vibe from some people that they are not aiming at peace when they are talking to me. Does anybody ever get that vibe? Like, like it does not feel like you are peace-loving right now. You should say that the next time you and your spouse are in an argument. It's like, are you peace-loving? It's just odd that whenever we are in our flesh, right, we tend to have our self-interest in mind. But God says that if we're under the Spirit's control, it kind of carves out some of the options of the anger that's being out of control or, or the fault-finding that bears the record of wrongs that 1 Corinthians 13 says that true love doesn't do. You see, God's Word will force you into a compliance or it'll force you into choosing to willfully disregard what you know would be best for your relationship. Because when you think about it, I don't think you want to live in a drama relationship. I think you'd rather have peace. But if you're not giving peace, then you're probably not going to get peace. And then you have the war of the roses. In Amos chapter 3, verse 3, a famous verse, it says, Do two walk together unless they have agreed to do so? In other words, if you were trying to hold somebody's hand, but they weren't walking in the same direction, be very difficult. You wouldn't be able to get very far, and then all of a sudden, a distance would begin to, begin, begin to become created between you and the person that you say you love. Imagine so many marriages were at the altar, and they were holding hands, and they were united that day. They were one. They even usually say it. You are one in life, one in destiny, all your stuff shared together forever and ever, for better or worse. Amen. And you agreed. You said yes to that, okay? That's why we write it down and we send it to the court to remind you that you agreed. And so then you get along in life and, and, and pretty soon if your heart is divided and you allow these distractions to come in and they begin to usurp what you agreed was the priority, all of a sudden you start getting pulled in different directions. Um, I have a clip that happened to me this week, um, and sometimes God just blesses me with sermon material. So uh, Ben Burbrick, our finance pastor, uh, we went fishing on Thursday, and the wind kind of blew up, and we got that little bit of rain, right? A little bit of, whew, and then it's like gone. We need more rain. And so anyway, uh, Ben is the only person that's ever fallen off my boat, um, and apparently it's becoming a habit. And so um, I'll let you watch this, and then we'll discuss. Well, it's happened again. <laughs> Happened again. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh, baby. Oh, baby. Oh, baby. Oh, baby. Oh, baby. <laughs> All right. I got the prop disengaged. i tell you how it happened. Dude, we're in six foot rollers, tree out in the middle of nowhere, big out tree. of the water, big tree. Throw at it, throw at it. Well, I missed it three times, 
because the front of the boat's going up and down viciously, violently. And I finally got in there because I was called names. Then I got hung up. And all I had to do was like keep backing up. He was backing up. And a little bit of water was coming over the back, which is fine. Like there's water all over everything. Well, then he decides to go forward while I'm on the back. And it, it threw me off, Hollis. That's what happens. But thank God I float. <laughs> oh, I, I thought, what a great illustration. Um, I was trying to back up so that he could get his lure unhung. And, and then a big wave came over the back. So then the, the front started filling up with water. I mean, it has a bilge pump, but I just don't like all my stuff getting wet. So like I engaged it forward, but I didn't realize that he was leaning back. And I turned around, I heard him yell, and he was gone. I mean, <laughs> Ben, was, and it, you saw the water. I mean, it was, it was kind of, it was a little hectic um, at that moment. But I still found the humor in it. So <laughs> I just thought that so oftentimes that when we're, when we're going in opposite directions, right? The Bible says that we won't arrive. We won't arrive together. When you think about it, if you're on the different pages with what marriage is about, if you're about you and they're about them and no one's about God, then you're not ever going to arrive at the sweet spot. You're not going to arrive at a love that lifts you up, a love that makes you feel the wholeness that God intended in the unity and the sanctity of marriage. You won't arrive at the same place for what your children are trying to get to and, and you're trying to bring them to what God has for them. There's so many things that you're going to miss and, and I hate it because I see relationships where someone falls overboard because they were on different pages and, and I hate to say it but so many times people out of selfish ambition, man, they just keep going and the distance grows and the drowning begins to occur and, and people are bobbing and they come in here any given Sunday and, and they are just one Sunday away from disaster in their lives. I hope today that you would begin thinking, like, how can you come into the alignment of God's word for your relationships? Our second clip that we're going to look at um, is kind of interesting. And uh, the staff ideated, we had a great uh, ideation collaboration set this week, and we were discussing this one. And there was this uh, opportunity for them to both be honest. I don't know if you guys remember where it happens in the movie, but it's, it's uh, he invites her to his parents' house. And we later find out that he's never brought a girl home before. So this one's serious. And, and, and unintended, right, unintended, all of a sudden this game that was being played starts to move into a real place and there's this honesty moment, this opportunity for honesty, and ooh, they both let it slip by. Let's watch this together. Everything all right? Okay? Oh, no, it's more than okay. I love everything about this house, the noise, the smells. Oh, well, the smells, that, that's Uncle Arnold, I mean. <sighs> It's just that when your mom hugged me today, she really hugged me. Sweetie, that's a good thing. Smile. Smile. Now, come on, give me a smile. Okay, that's good. That's it. You should scare me. <laughs> See that? That authentic affection was getting her, wasn't it? Have you ever been masquerading in a relationship with an ulterior motive and that other person is being nice to you when you know that you're being mean to them and it starts to wear on you, unless you're a sociopath. You know, it's, <laughs> it starts wearing on you because you're like, why is this person being so nice to me? We actually see it Almost every Sunday, when people walk to the doors and 
the people that are greeting you, you don't even know them, and they're like shaking your hand, you know, welcoming you, hey, and it's almost so nice that if you're used to living in an insincere world, like you feel like these people are plotting on me, right? <laughs> like this, this can be, we've had people say it to us, like when I first came, it was like, you know, y'all were just a little too nice, like, you know, like cult level nice, you know? <laughs> Like, I don't know if these people are being... Isn't it weird how when we are living insincere lives, it's hard for us to receive sincere love? Think about that. I think this is where Christians and the, the exercise of coming to church every Sunday, it's a little bit bipolar because we oftentimes live... Not for Jesus, right? I mean, like, if you, like, graded it out, your week, like, was Monday for Jesus, Tuesday for Jesus, Wednesday for Jesus. If, if you graded it out, probably, like, you know, five days out of seven, maybe six, you know, weren't for Jesus, then we give Jesus Sunday. Think about that for just a moment. So we, we, we insincerely enter the house of worship almost knowing that there's some things that are messed up in my life, but I'm drawn like a moth to the flame that I need this. I know there's something that I need. I haven't made the changes yet. And so then you come in here and the word of God starts going out like arrows, right? And it's just like hitting you. And you know that you need to make these changes because God's sincere love is pulling you toward him and your insincere life. And now you're having this moment like God really hugged me. Like he really did. Like when we were singing like the worship songs today and I, don't you tell me he can't do it. Don't you tell me he can't do it. Like I've seen, I've seen it happen. I've seen, I know it's true. I know it's real. Isn't it interesting how you're drawn to it? You try to push back from it. Man, I hope today that you would, you would see that God gives you these moments every Sunday. Every Sunday is an opportunity for transformation. Just because you've been this way all your life doesn't mean that you have to live the rest of your life that way. I thought about one of the interesting moments in the Bible. I think a paradoxical moment. It happened with Judas in John chapter 13. It says that while they were taking the Last Supper, the communion, and Jesus was instituting it, Jesus is so overt like, I don't know if you think that Judas kind of like just fell into the mistake that he made, but, but he didn't. Jesus said, tonight, one of you shall betray me. And a funny little aside, it says, Peter was sitting down the table and he motioned to John, who was sitting beside Jesus. He's like, ask him who it is. I know you feel like everybody was like, Judas, we know it's Judas, but it was, they, they all had these flaws. I mean, my money would have been on Thomas. He was, he was a doubter, okay? And so I just think it's hilarious that Peter's over there like, ask him. And so he tells John, and John's like, uh, so Jesus, who, uh, who is it? And then Jesus says these words. He says, I'm going to dip my bread into the oil, and the person to whom I give it to is the one that shall betray me. And then he went. Man, if I was Judas, I'd be like, hey, Thomas, that's you. Can you, can you imagine if you ever, I didn't even want to put the next verse because I didn't want to distract you. It says, Right after that verse, it's like then Satan entered into Judas and he went and did what he did. Don't you think, gosh, he had this moment where God couldn't be more clear, more clear that this is getting ready to happen. Judas, you have a choice to make and then Judas makes the choice anyway. And I thought, well, that's probably not too far off. I bet you've never gotten down the road into a giant fiasco and that you, if you're honest, can't look back and say, God was sending me a sign. I mean, he, like literally, I went into that church and that preacher told me, don't do it. Don't text her back. 
Don't keep hanging out with those people. Every time you hang out with that person, you come home and you're negative about your marriage because they're all negative about theirs and you feel like you've got to be part of the club. It's insanity. God constantly gives us these warning signs. Overt! Some of you, this morning you're getting dipped, right? Now you thought you're just going to come in another Sunday. Oh, how does preach? How lose God ten days? It's going to be this fluff sermon, and then like you get in here and like some the worship songs start. Like I see, I've watched the evolution. Some of you like you walk in, and you're like you know it's been a long week, and I'm tired. And then like you know it's just like a little bit like okay, a little bit of bop, and then it's like you know, and then like songs, and then like I see sometimes I see even like grown men, it's like a little bit of sweat in their eyes, you know, and. And now your heart is like there, like, I want to see the walls fall. Come on, Jesus. And then the sermon begins. You're like, oh, that's funny. That's cute. And then it's like, oh, but I'm setting you up. (laughs) I hope today that you would hear the voice of God saying, hey, it's dipping. It's telling you. You're getting close to that edge. Why would you want to throw everything away? Why would you want to do that? Is it it that God's way could be better for your life? We'll finish up because every love story has to have a happy ending. Let's watch. That's what it takes, yeah, now pull over the gas! Watch it, boy! Is this true? Ben, please! Is this true? Or are you just trying to sell magazines? I meant every word. Well, where are you going? I have an interview. Yeah, in Washington. I know. Where are you going? Ben, it's the only place I can go and write what I want to write. No, I'm not buying that. You can write anywhere. I think you're running away. Why don't you save your mind games for your next bet, okay? I am not running away. Bo. Excuse me? You heard me. Take the lady's luggage back to her place. She has alternate transportation. You call my bluff? You bet I am. You're sitting beside your loved one, just reach over there, grab their hand, squeeze it. If you're single and the person looks single beside you, just go for it. <laughs> and that's how we met. <laughs> we'll wrap this sermon with a point I'm going to call love worth chasing. Love worth chasing. He asked a question, where are you going? And then he repeated the question, where are you going? And I just thought I'd ask you, where are you going? Where are you going? Where are you going in your marriage? Where are you going in your friendships? Where are you going in your professional life? Where are you going in your spiritual life? Where are you going? Because it's amazing, like, she starts answering, but the answers that she's given, like, are just words, but they're not real, right? And then he's pushing her. And I think that's the beauty in relationships is there's always a tug of war going on for our heart, for our affections, for our priorities, and... And we need someone that can get past the surface level. And I think that all humanity wants to be known on the deepest level, the deepest level of our hearts. And I think that's only possible when both parties are right with God. He said, I think you're running away. And I think we see this often, right? Where so many times in relationships, I think people throw their hands up in the air and they say, it'd just be easier, it'd just be easier to start over. And they throw their hands, and I'm not talking about with abuse or adultery. I'm just talking about you don't want to put in the work. 
that it takes to have a love relationship. It's hard work. So many people want to live in frictionless friendships. And I tell you that if you're friends long enough with anyone, with anyone, that you are going to have friction. And so many times I think we live in such a weak society that people say, well, if, if things were right, then there wouldn't be any friction. And they quit. They quit marriages. They quit jobs. They even quit churches. Like someone has some drama, and then they want to bring you in their drama, and the drama didn't have anything to do with you, and then you just like get consumed with it, and you say, oh, well, we must just start over at the next place. And then you start at that place, and you go through the whole process, and you repeat it cycle after cycle after cycle. I know at some juncture, you might want to realize that you're never going to have long-lasting relationships if you're not willing to work through things. Proverbs 18, 22 says, A man who finds a wife finds a good thing and obtains favor from the Lord. Man, I hope all the men in here that your love that you have for your wife is worth chasing after her. It's worth pursuing after her. God has put the onus on you as the man of the house to pursue your wife. I hope that you realize that your children are worth chasing after, even when they are running into dark places. That love, man, it'll chase. Love will put forth the effort. We flip this around from a gospel perspective, and when he was knocking on the window and she rolled, What are you doing? You trying to get yourself killed? And he had a line. He said, If that's what it takes. I want you to think about that with this verse. You see, at just the right time, when we were powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person, someone might possibly dare to die. But God proves his love to you in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. I want you to think about that for just a moment. Stretch this template over the entire message and ask yourself, what selfish ambition, what envy could God have had as he looks at your life? What can you add to him that makes him more whole, more great, more awesome? It says that God proved his love to you. And that while you were at your worst, when you were as far, running as hard as you can after the things that are trying to satisfy you, they promise you, and then they always overpromise and underdeliver, and you're still wandering through life, you still have not found happiness, you still have not found contentment, though you've accomplished things that are beyond your wildest expectations, the innermost part of your heart is still restless. Could I suggest to you today that we live in an insincere world that does not know true love? It only knows a self-fulfilling, you know, we even say it like you, you got to do what's best for you. You got to do what makes you happy. And that's so wrong. We got to do what makes God happy. And you know what makes God happy when our hearts are right with him? And you know what makes us happy when our hearts are right with him? Think about that for just a moment. That he loved you sincerely at the cross he loved you bigger he loved you better when you could add nothing to him that is sincere love isn't it hard for you to sit in a sermon and know that there's a God that is chasing after you I bet it's really hard if you aren't chasing after him and if you aren't reciprocating his love you're sitting in this message and there's this internal conflict raging just below the surface and you could calm those waters if you would just let go just receive the love that God has for you and I know you might have gone through some relationships that burned you some preachers that disappointed you, whatever your story is. But you know who's never disappointed? That's Jesus. 
Do you know who has never done you wrong? And that's Jesus. Do you know who is consistent? More than you are consistent. It's Jesus. He's chasing after you. And I pray, maybe someone today needs to receive the love that God has given you at the cross. And I pray for the rest of your life. That might humble you, but it also might want you, make you want to love others that way. Change the way you love. And I think that more people will be reached if we learn to love sincerely without having any gain involved. Don't you think, don't you want to be loved like that? Yeah. So if you've received it, I think you, you owe it to God to love people better. Let's pray. Father, we ask you to help us break down these walls. God, help us to love sincerely in all of our relationships that we would put ourselves second. And God, the freedom that we find when we learn to love like you love. I pray, God, for the most hardened individual in here today that would say to themselves, I don't even know this God thing is real. I don't even know why I'm sitting in this room. And yet, here you are. Is it possible today that God is chasing after you, weaving in and out of traffic, desperately trying to get to you? And today is possibly your day. Your day to say yes to Jesus. You say, well, how can I know, Tim? How can I know? How can I know? How can I know? I bet your heart is telling you everything you need to know right now. If it's been broken into a thousand pieces, man, you can't put Humpty Dumpty back together again. And God says he doesn't even fix your heart. You know what he says he does? He gives you a new heart. Brand new one. Capable of doing all the things that God wants you to do in life. All you have to do is say yes. Now on the back end, are there expectations? Sure. You should want to change. You should want to grow. You should want to be transformed. Not out of obligation though out of gratitude that your approximation to living like Jesus challenges you to be better love deeper care more we're going to give you another chance to respond to God through worship would you guys stand and join us at this time